A burning fireball hurtles across the wintry December skies, seen by thousands over six US states and Ontario in Canada. Just the start of a story that interweaves meteorites, men in black, the US military, Russian satellites and time-travelling Nazis. Welcome to Worlds Beyond and the case of the Kecksburg crash. Hello and welcome to Worlds Beyond. I'm your host Steve Yarwood and thanks for joining me in looking at another classic UFO case. This instalment we're going to look at the Kecksburg crash. Let's go back to 1965. Stateside the Watts riots took place in August, whilst here in the UK Winston Churchill died in the January. In September Thunderbirds is first shown on British TV. Petrol is only 5 shillings, that's 25 pence uh, for a gallon, and you can buy a brand new E-Type Jag for £1,867. And right at the tail end of the year, the 9th of December to be precise, it became a winter's evening that brought something unexpected to those who were looking to the heavens. People in the states of Ohio, where the first report from Toledo came in, Indiana, Michigan, New York, Virginia and Pennsylvania in the United States and Ontario in Canada observed a fiery ball of light hurtling through the winter's evening sky, leaving a debris trail that lasted for quite a while in the sky. In Toledo, the residents were first alerted to the object by a blinding flash of blue-white light in the sky that they initially thought was an exploding plane. The majority of observers put it down to what they obviously thought was a meteor, but with other evidence and testimonies it seems the case goes much deeper than a run-of-the-mill meteor, so much so that after 55 years it's still a mystery and a highly contentious and controversial case for UFO investigators and researchers. Over the years people have drawn similarities between the famous Roswell incident and the happenings at Kecksburg. Because of this the Kecksburg case has been called Pennsylvania's Roswell. Anyway, let's start putting together elements of witness reports, create a timeline in doing so, and then later on have a look at some explanations and theories as to what happened on that wintry December night back in 1965 around 4.15pm local time. On the evening of the incident people claimed to have witnessed sonic booms, shock waves and even reported that the object had started grass fires in western Pennsylvania. Other witnesses said they saw molten metal dripping over Ohio and Michigan. Apparently there were also several pilots who said their aircraft were knocked around by shock waves as a large burning object whizzed past their airplanes. As most meteorites usually travel thousands of feet above most commercial airline flight paths, this was considered unusual. This is what allegedly happened next. Two children reported an object coming to rest in the woods just outside Kecksburg. Other witnesses in the area had felt a vibration and a dull thump precisely at the moment that the object was reported to have landed. A local volunteer firefighting crew turned up to the site of where the object had come down and reported they had found an object that resembled the shape of an acorn in shape but much, much larger, around the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. Stranger still was that around the base of the acorn shaped object there appeared to be hieroglyphic type writing on it. Local witnesses started to head to the crash site but on arriving found that a military unit were there and had taken over the area. This unit told local police, the fire department and all civilians to leave. And once the area was clear, the military unit loaded the object onto the back of a flatbed truck, covered it over with sheets and drove it away. At the time, however, the military claimed they had indeed searched the woods outside of Kecksburg and had found absolutely nothing. Also, a reporter from the nearby town of Greensburg for the newspaper The Tribune Review was on the scene. Next morning's headline read, Unidentified flying object falls near Kecksburg. Army ropes off the area. The article stated... The area where the object landed was immediately sealed off on the order of the US Army and state police officials, reportedly in anticipation of a close inspection of whatever may have fallen. State police officials there ordered the area roped off to await the expected arrival of both US Army engineers and possibly 
civilian scientists. A later edition contradicted this stating that nothing reportedly had been found after authorities had searched the area. The official explanation of the fireball that it was a mid-sized meteor, possibly a bolide. Why the long time confusing contentious mystery you may ask? Time to look at some of the other stuff that has floated about since this has happened. As ever, I'm going to present with what my research has found so that you can either make your own mind up from what I will present here, or if it piques your interest, delve a little further by doing some research of your own. Let's start with the meteor. Looking through the Project Blue Book files from the word go, they had the object down as a meteor. Major Quintanella spoke to Major Howard from the Pentagon the day after the sighting, informing him of the witnesses from numerous states that had witnessed it. There was a visual sighting that had not been picked up on radar and that a team of men were sent out from Oakdale Radar Site, who along with members of the State Highway Patrol, searched for the object until 2am but found nothing. He told Major Howard that they had looked into the possibility of space debris but none had entered the atmosphere on December the 9th. Finally he informed him that the investigation was still ongoing. He also received a query from Houston Space Centre and again he informed them that an Air Force team with the State Highway Patrol was out searching a location 45 to 50 miles east of Pittsburgh. The Flint Journal rang to say they had found some pieces of a gold flat substance in Flint, Michigan. These pieces were about an inch long and one sixteenth of an inch wide. Quintanella asked them to send a piece into Blue Book for analysis. This debris was later found to be chaff that is used in aircraft to fool radar and enemy targeting systems. As ever though, people distrust the official line, and within days, the 16th of December to be precise, the Thursday edition of the Amarillo Globe Times, part of the North American Newspaper Alliance, printed an article by famed writer, cryptozoologist and paranormal researcher Ivan T. Sanderson that was published under the heading, Scientists Say's Flying Object Was Not a Meteorite. He had compiled a detailed account from various eyewitnesses and he soon realised there was more to this story than that of a simple meteorite. His findings indicated that the object showed a clear trajectory, moving from northwest to southeast. Its total visible journey lasted no more than six minutes, which indicated a speed far too low for a meteor. Sanderson calculated a speed of only around a thousand miles per hour, and the most convincing aspect of the sighting to Sanderson that ruled out any possibility of the object being a meteorite was the object appeared to change direction at one point and then head in an easterly direction. Unfortunately, according to other researchers, Sanderson's methodology, in the way he was pinpointing witness locations and then leaving other sighting locations out, gave false data and if followed correctly would not have seemed to show the meteor changing direction. Also his maths in regarding the speed were out by a factor of 60, as his calculations were referring to miles per hour instead of miles per minute. Therefore it must have been a meteor that streaked away and disappeared over the western horizon over Lake Erie. To go into the math and mapping errors would take up far much time, so if you're interested in the rest, I will leave a link in the description below. And whilst you're clicking away down there, please help support me by liking and subscribing. But what happens to the rest of the case if it was nothing more than a meteor? Welcome to the confusing, contradictory and contentious world of ufology. Let's have a look at the alleged crashed or landed object and its also alleged aftermath. Much of what I'm going to relate to you now is a possible timeline derived from many different sources. About 10 miles north from Kecksburg lies the small town of Greensburg. As most towns did in the USA, they had a local radio station. In this one, it was WHJB. John Murphy was a radio reporter for the station. A little after 6.30pm, he took a call from a woman saying she had seen a bright burning star over Greensburg heading towards the nearby town of Kecksburg. She had took her children to an area just outside of Kecksburg where they found a gouge cut into the earth made by the object. There was lots of smoke but she managed to get to high ground and peer down to see what she thought was a four-pointed star. Murphy called the Pennsylvania State Troopers thinking it may be an aircraft that had come down. And also that would be big news for a local radio station. On arriving at the scene, Murphy found he couldn't gain access as the army had blocked all inroads. Contacting the state police again, he told them about the army blocking the roads and he was told in no uncertain terms that nothing had happened. Somehow he managed to get inside the car and quickly take some pictures then return, speaking to people who had been turned away by the military. He took their names and addresses, went back to the radio station and got his portable tape recorder and interviewed witnesses in their homes. Once he had enough stories he compiled and edited them and he was going to broadcast them under the title Object in the Woods. The broadcast would tell about the initial sighting, 
what witnesses observed at the sites of the crash, and detailed descriptions of the object that many people claim to have seen. This put Kecksburg well and truly on the radar. The then manager of WHJB has since said that he did see one of the pictures that Murphy had taken. He stated that although the picture was, quote, very dark and with a lot of trees in the way, he felt he saw something that definitely looked cone-shaped. But we'll talk more of John Murphy shortly. Since the date of the original sighting, UFO researchers have reopened and re-examined the case, so at this point I will add some of the alleged new information. Residents came forward to say before being turned away by the military, the local fire service team had come within 200 feet of the object. They had also noticed that the tops of the trees had been broken as though something had come through from above. They also mentioned that the fire team had noticed blue flashing lights. This was corroborated by a witness who was just a kid at the time who lived in a nearby farm. One witness went into the woods and arrived on the scene just before the military, who said he found a large acorn shaped object with what looked to be bumpers on the bottom with hieroglyphics on the surface. As he got nearer to the object he then heard voices coming close and decided it would be best if he got out of there. Another witness said he saw the military load it onto a flatbed truck and drive it out of there covered in sheets. Back in 1990 a new witness came forward with some new and quite terrifying information. He alleged that he was in fact part of the military team that was sent to retrieve the object at Kecksburg and claimed that he was given orders that he was to shoot anyone who got too close. He also claimed that the object was being transported to Wright-Patterson Base, which was also the home of Project Blue Book and its previous incarnations of Project Sign and Project Grudge. Back in 2003, something weird happened. Not paranormal weird, but the fact that the Sci-Fi Channel actually sponsored a scientific study of the crash area and acquired all the related records through the Freedom of Information Act. One of the things they found that one scientist said could be attributed to ice damage actually corroborated witness testimony in that they found substantial damage to treetops leading up to the area where witnesses saw the object. Samples taken from the trees pointed to the date of the damage to being 1965. They also reported minor soil disturbance in the same area. An attempt to get NASA to reveal any documentation brought forth 40 pages worth of totally unrevealing information. And while we're mentioning NASA, let's have a quick look at their involvement. Although the official report put the case down as a meteorite, it was also speculated that the object might have been Cosmos 96. Cosmos 96 was a failed Russian probe that was intended to fly off to Venus, but in fact never left the Earth's atmosphere. But according to a report from 1991, Cosmos 96 crashed in Canada 13 hours before the object over Kecksburg was first reported. In a 2003 interview, as part of the Sci-Fi Channel investigation, Chief Scientist for Orbital Debris at the NASA Johnson Space Centre, Nicholas L. Johnson, stated, and I quote, I can tell you categorically there is no way that any debris from Cosmos 96 could have landed in Pennsylvania anywhere around 4.45pm. That's an absolute. Orbital mechanics is very strict. Johnson also stated there were no other known man-made satellites or other objects that re-entered the atmosphere on the day of the Kecksburg sighting. Yet, as a total contradiction, just before the 40th anniversary of the Kecksburg crash in December 2005, NASA released a new statement saying that they had examined metallic fragments from the object and were now claiming it was from a re-entering Russian satellite. The spokesman who released the statement then went on to claim that related records had been misplaced. According to an Associated Press story, David states NASA Media Relations had this to say, and I quote, The object appeared to be a Russian satellite that re-entered the atmosphere and broke up. NASA experts studied fragments from the object, but records of what they found were lost in the 1990s. As a rule, we don't track UFOs. What we could do, and what we apparently did as experts in spacecraft in the 1960s, was to take a look at wherever it was and give our expert opinion. We did that, we boxed the case up, and that was the end of it. Unfortunately, the documents supporting those findings were misplaced. Now, NASA seemed to have a habit of misplacing records, as it also appears that the original tapes of the Apollo 11 moon landings have been lost or reused. Although copies of these tapes have been found, the original transmission tapes, the ones recorded before being relayed out, believe me, this is a story in itself, NASA have stated that the originals were either destroyed or reused. 
A lawsuit was filed in December 2005 to get NASA to do a proper search for the lost record. Almost two years later, NASA finally agreed, much to the continuing frustration of the judge who had issued the lawsuit, who referred to NASA's search efforts as a ball of yarn. And just to continue a theme, during the hearing, NASA's public liaison officer, Steve McConnell, went on to admit that boxes of papers from the time of the Kexper incident were missing. What's the old saying? Once is an accident, twice is coincident, three times is a pattern? Back in 2008, space writer James Olberg was of the opinion that NASA was unlikely to possess any documents. His view was that those who were on site identifying themselves as NASA personnel were more than likely Air Force personnel. Apparently, something done on a regular basis by civilian clothed military personnel during the 60s. This statement to me at least could also open up another can of worms. Finally, in November 2009, Leslie Keane filed the report of the results of the NASA search. Documents pertaining to the Kecksburg case were indeed missing, and also a box of debris. Keane said in her report that the files could be missing for a number of reasons. Bad filing, being misplaced, filed outside of search parameters, still classified, deliberately hidden, files removed by NASA and not put back, and they actually did name one of the personnel who did this, search staff unfamiliar with searching for these types of files, and of course, destroyed. And as the plaintiffs couldn't search for the material themselves, they had to take NASA's word for it. Now mention had been made by witnesses that many of the personnel at the site who were turning people away were wearing different uniforms. Some allegedly were wearing NASA patches. Witnesses at a nearby farmhouse spotted uniform types speaking to their father, and they were wearing NASA patches also. At the height of the Cold War, which 1965 was certainly part of that, NASA was involved in the tracking and retrieval of any possible Soviet satellite tech, so if this was a possible down Russian satellite, it would make sense for them to be there. And that would also make sense about the three-man team out of Oakdale who was still searching until two in the morning. This team is now known to have been part of the covert Air Force project, Project Moondust. Moondust's aim was to recover and exploit Soviet hardware if it landed or appeared on American soil. This was then allegedly extended to recovering alien crafts, occupants, bodies or technology. In October 2015, MUFON announced that they had found another probable culprit for the object. They had information that had apparently been revealed in 1991 that what fell near Kecksburg may have actually been a nuclear weapons capable GE Mark II re-entry vehicle and spy satellite. Stan Gordon, who's an expert on the Kecksburg case and was a teen living in Kecksburg when the event took place, contacted a witness who had seen the object close up and shown him the photograph of the satellite. On examining the picture, the witness said, not even close, no comparison. You can see it's man-made and constructed. He stated that what he saw looked like one piece of metal, looked like it was forged using liquid metal and poured into an acorn shaped mould. This thing you couldn't stand up inside of, while the acorn you could. The witness also stated the acorn was about twice the size of the object in the picture. If you really want to look more into this case I do suggest you look at Stan Garden's work. One of the last new witnesses to have come forward was a trucker who was delivering bricks to Wright-Patterson around the 16th of December 1965. He was told by the military just to do his job and not look around. It's not really very high security that is it just telling somebody not to look round. Of course he did look round, saw people with hazard suits coming out of the building and then without any effort at all managed to get in there. Once inside he saw that there was an object on stilts obscured by parachute type material. He went through this material and saw an acorn shaped object with hieroglyphics around the bottom bumper of it. Then he was discovered, held at gunpoint, and then was told not to say anything. Uh, don't say anything to anyone, as it'll all be common knowledge in 20 years' time. Now there's two things here. It's been more than 20 years and nothing's actually been said. And secondly, the lack of security. You know, you're a naughty boy type outcome. This stinks to me similar to some of the Roswell claims that were coming out of the woodwork when the bandwagon started rolling. I did say earlier that we were going to talk more about radio host and reporter John Murphy, who had taped interviews with witnesses and was about to broadcast them as a documentary on local station WHJB. About a week after the incident, Murphy was preparing to deliver his radio documentary. Then, as in many instances, men in black types showing up. According to one of the radio station's receptionists, 
two men shown up looking for John Murphy. They said they were from the federal government. Now nearly all radio stations have a glass window so you can see into the broadcast room and she could see the two men talking to Murphy. Things were apparently getting heated and they moved towards him in a menacing manner. Murphy at first appeared to be standing his ground with the two men but then she could see his defiance slowly dissipating to a point that he just sat down in his chair, nodded to them and the men then took all of Murphy's notes, audio tapes and photographs and then left the building. Murphy broadcast what appeared to be a heavily censored version of what was originally going to air. This basically consisted of a report from the state police saying that despite the constant rumours, nothing had indeed happened and certainly there was no downed object. Murphy became very withdrawn and agitated over the next few years and in February 1969, Murphy, whilst on holiday in California, was killed in an apparent hit and run accident. At the top of the show I gave you a list of what we were going to be covering. Now let's see. Meteorites. Check. The US military. Check. Russian satellites. Check. Men in black. Check. Hmm, what's missing? I know, time travelling Nazis. I love these tales, it makes me feel like the Indiana Jones of ufology. Now first let me say that this in itself is a massive subject. So for the sake of time within this episode, I'm only going to impart the bare bones of the subject, but rest assured, Nazi UFO technology and associated subjects will be covered in a later episode. There's a long-standing belief that a UFO crashed near Freiburg in Germany's Black Forest in 1936, which was promptly recovered by Nazi SS troops. From there, it was taken to Weywillsburg Castle in Westphalia, the hub of Nazi paranormal research, where they launched a back engineering project on the recovered object. This back engineering led to several advanced flying machines for the Nazis before the end of the Second World War, which brings us to Die Glock, or the Bell. Polish author Igor Witkowski put forward the theories of Nazi secret weapons and particularly Die Glock in his book The Truth About the Wonder Weapon back in 2000. Die Glock was shaped like a bell. Well, it would be because it was called the bell. It was around 12 to 15 feet high, measuring 9 feet across, was made of a hard and heavy metal and had strange hieroglyphics around its base. It operated using anti-gravity technology that used two counter-rotating cylinders filled with red mercury. The effect zone of Die Glock when operational was around 600 feet. Within this area, blood would turn to gel and separate, crystals would form in animal tissue, and plants would completely decompose into a greasy substance. Seven scientists are alleged to have worked on this project, of which five of them died. It has been mentioned that Die Glock had mirrors inside that would show images of the past, and that anti-gravity technology could not only warp space and time, but even travel through time itself. Project leader Hans Kammler disappeared, as did Die Glock. He didn't appear in the US and Russian projects of Project Paperclip and Operation Osoyevakim, and they apologise if that is badly pronounced, which took leading German scientists, specifically in the areas of rocketry and nuclear sciences, and he literally disappeared off the face of the earth with his pet project. And there you have it, the Kecksburg crash mystery with all its twists, turns and convolutions. We're presented with a lot of possibilities. Was it a meteorite? A Russian satellite? A US satellite? An extraterrestrial craft? Or even was it just something about nothing? Or was it Hans Kammler on the final leg 20 years later of escaping through time, dropping in on the United States in his acorn-shaped space-time machine? See you next time on Worlds Beyond.